myself. Firstly, introducing myself, I'm Sandhya Chandrasekhar, associated with MCA Gulf taxation team as manager. Uh, thank you everyone once again for joining. We are really looking forward for this session, wherein we'll be taking you through the basics of corporate tax law, which everyone might be aware has been introduced in UAE. And it will be starting from after the financial year, June 2023. So uh, really looking forward for the session where we have our two expert speakers. Let me introduce you to today's speaker, Mr. Girish Chand, who is senior partner with NCA Gulf. He's heading the Gulf, uh, NCA Gulf compliance practice covering corporate tax, VAT, ESR, AML, and UBO. He has conducted various corporate tax, VAT, ESR seminars for large companies, professional bodies, industry groups, and authorities. And he's a regular contributor to Khalish Times on VAT topics, five plus years of experience in consulting practice and 25 plus years of experience in finance and internal audit, senior managerial roles in diverse industries. Also, he has 10 plus of experience in finance leadership roles in the downstream oil and gas business like Enoch, Echo, covering marketing, retail and trading. Coming to our next speaker is Mr. Nirav Shah, who is senior manager at NCA Gulf. He's a chartered accountant, CAS, CS, CMA, and LLB with over nine years of plus experience. And he's a subject matter expertise in corporate tax and international taxations. He has gained highly professional tax expertise by working with big four audit firms and also assisted various MNCs with respect to tax advisory, compliance, litigation, and support services. He has also conducted various corporate tax seminars and workshops for large companies. Now taking you through today's agenda, where we'll be covering shortly an overview of the MCA profile and the basics and also the corporate tax law and how to prepare for it. That is the most important as it would be affecting the business by 9% rate. So every, we all would be interested to take the action required wherein we are prepared for this smooth transitioning in the corporate tax regime. Also, please note we request everybody to be on mute uh, for the uh, session and also please note we'll be having a question and answer round at the end of the session. I request all the attendees to post your questions in the screen which is appearing in the chat box. Also uh, we can have a question and answer one-on-one -on -one round where you can raise hand, we'll unmute you and you can ask the questions. And also there would be a free one-on-one -on -one consultation, complimentary one-hour consultation with our expert speakers. The details would be posted over the chat box shortly. So we really look forward for today's uh, session. Over to you, Mr. Girish. Thank you. Thank you, Sandhya. Uh, good morning, everybody. Okay, so uh, I think uh, considering the interest that has been shown in the corporate tax uh, sessions uh, today, although I think uh, we are almost uh, maybe about two months after the, you know, the law being introduced, uh, rather it will almost be three months. Okay, but that shows the level of interest and the basically you know, the importance that is there for this uh, legislation as such. Okay, I think uh, we all recognize that uh, as far as the corporate tax is concerned, the impact is greater as compared to uh, VAT because uh, there is a straight impact on the uh, bottom line of the uh, company. So as uh, Sandhya mentioned, uh, primarily the session today We'll start with the MCA profile. Okay, we will take you through the basics of the corporate tax. Uh, we'll take you through the uh, detailed uh, provisions. And uh, at the end, uh, primarily, we will talk about, you know, how do we uh, prepare for the uh, corporate, corporate tax uh, compliance, you know, which is expected to be starting shortly. Okay, so we start with the MCA profile. Right. So we have, we have been uh, in the uh, GCC for almost uh, 14 years now, and uh, predominantly, uh, you know, we are in UAE and also covering the other uh, GCC countries such as 
you know, Bahrain, Oman, uh, and the newer editions have been in the Qatar and in uh, KSC. Okay. As you can see from the graphics, uh, basically we, you know, we have served over 1500 clients. Uh, we basically have, uh, you know, close to 80 plus staff, uh, you know, several senior people as directors and also as uh, partners. So when we look at our services, I think very simply put, uh, we basically cover right from the establishment of the entity uh, till God forbid the uh, liquidation of the entity. Of course, the journey through would be covering the fields like whether it is accounting, whether it is uh, taxation, whether it is compliance, right? Uh, whether it is governance risk, uh, including internal audits, corporate finance, so the entire gambit of services uh, is what we cover as a management consultancy and an auditing firm. So this is the leadership uh, team. Maybe you see one familiar face who's today on the session, that's me. Uh, we also have a well-experienced uh, management team for the various uh, verticals that we basically uh, handle. And here again, you'll see one familiar face, uh, Nirav Shah, who is on this session today. Right, on the industry specialization, considering that uh, our leadership team have had the experience of more than, uh, I would say, more than two decades. Okay, some of us may be three decades. Uh, so primarily, I think we have covered most of the industries that are prevalent in the world. Uh, yeah, I'll always request people to keep their mics on mute while the session is going on. Yeah, we'll move on. Right, this is where we, you know, just that uh, repetition in terms of the five countries that we cover. Right, in terms of our clientele, again, like our industry coverage, uh, where it, you know, wide industries are covered. Similarly, in the clientele or in the, you know, various industries we have, you know, dealt with MNCs, uh, financial services, uh, real estate and construction. The names are on the screen as such. Yeah, I wouldn't go through the names. So similarly, hospitality, uh, transportation and logistics, consumer products, retail, technology, manufacturing and distribution, and even including the government sector. Right, I think the last bit of slides is about energy, uh, digital and others, so including you know, startups, we have been associated even with that. So when we look at our clientele portal, we include even the, uh, you know, SME sector to very large entities, including public listed entities. Right, so as far as the corporate tax presentation, as we are referring to the basics, So just a background that uh, when we look at this corporate tax journey, the announcement basically came on 31st of January, 2022, okay? On 20th of April, 2022, there was a public consultation document, which basically is a document where the draft corporate tax law was uh, uh, basically introduced. Uh, primarily, the objective was to take the feedback from uh, from the public in general, right? So if you look at in terms of possibly the corporate tax uh, coverage perspective, I think this public consultation document was little in detail, right? However, we need to bear in mind that it was a draft as such. So now what has happened is that on 9th of December, we now have the corporate tax uh, decree law, right? Now, what we need to understand is that generally when we look at legislation introduction, okay, it's a progressive kind of introduction. So I usually can or give a, you know, kind of an example of a building, right? So when we look at today, the corporate tax law being introduced, it is more in, in the nature of the structure of the building laid out, right? Now, uh, practically the, uh, you know, the interiors and stuff that, as far as the corporate tax uh, legislation is concerned, that would be in the form of cabinet decisions, 
So unlike the uh, VAT legislation, which was introduced, you know, we had in the VAT legislation, we had the law and we had the uh, executive regulations, which practically provided the detailed explanation of the law. Okay. Unlike that, what we are expecting in the corporate tax introduction is that we have the law which has come out. However, there might not be an executive regulation detailing everything, but it would be more in the form of, uh, you know, cabinet decisions, right? And uh, we have seen one such cabinet decision come out where the law did not specify the limits. However, the cabinet decision specified the limits of, you know, up to 375 and uh, beyond 375, like the 0% and the uh, 9%. Okay, so now uh, just uh, some basics and uh, please pardon me if in the audience there are people who already know this. Okay, this is more in the interest of the uh, larger audience, right? So when we refer to corporate tax as such, uh, basically it's something which we say is a direct tax which is applied on the net income of corporate of the organization as such, right? Uh, we all uh, possibly now know why it has been introduced. One, of course, you know, UAE wants to cement its position as a leading global hub for business and investment. Okay, and of course, uh, in in sense, accelerates its development and transformation because any form of taxation is primarily used by the government in terms of uh, revenue generation for its development and uh, effectively for you know achieving its strategic objectives. I think the more important part of it, and possibly that is where the urgency has been, is that. Primarily, it was the alignment of the U.S. commitment for tax transparency and preventive, preventing the harmful tax practices. Okay, so as per the BEPS action plan, right, there was a minimum rate of tax which was proposed. Okay, and that is where, you know, effectively, if UAE had not introduced, I think, especially where there are MNCs, what would have it led is that the parent company jurisdiction would have the right to levy taxes on the entity in the UAE. And that is possibly one of the drivers where, uh, you know, for UAE to introduce the corporate tax as such. Okay, in terms of what I spoke earlier, how is it different from VAT? I think generally when we look at in the VAT context, if you are generally efficient, okay, and you do not have any exempt supplies, there is no impact on the entity's business per se, right? Unlike uh, the corporate tax, uh, basically, you know, there is a straight impact on the entity's profitability because you end up paying 9% on your taxable profit. I think Nero will take us through in terms of what is taxable profit vis-a-vis -vis the book profit that we currently know as such. Okay, these are again some basics. I think probably most of the people know, but just for clarity, it is for financial year starting on and after 1st June, 2023. So we commonly hear the reference saying that, you know, corporate tax is starting from 1st June 2023 as such. But that will not be the case. Uh, it will depend on your financial year. So for example, the financial year normally is referred to as a calendar year or 12 month period for which the taxable person prepares his financial statements. So most of the entities in the UAE would follow the financial year of 1st Jan to 31st December as such. So for those entities, the effective date would be from 1st Jan 2024 onwards. And the effective year would be 1st Jan to 31st December 2024. Similarly, entities which are following the financial year of 1st April to 31st March, for such entities, the, uh, you know, the effective date would be from 1st April 2024 to 31st of March 2025. Right, like I mentioned, uh, this was something which was, you know, clarified officially in the cabinet decision, right? Uh, so now the rate of tax is for your, basically the taxable profit up to 375,000, the rate is 0%. Beyond, you know, 375,000, the rate will be at 9%. Also, there is a provisio where effectively, 
you know, where there are MNCs and which have turnovers in excess of Euro 750 million, there could be a possibility that when UAE adopts the pillar two of the OECD base erosion and profit shifting, you know, shortly referred as BEPS, right? In such scenario, there could be that such MNCs could be taxed at 15%. As of now, it is not in effect. Right, so we, a small example as far as the, how do we calculate? Suppose if the taxable profit or income is 500,000, in such case, the first 375,000 will be subject to 0%. And, you know, primarily over the 375,000, which is 125,000, the rate of 9% will be levied. Therefore, the uh, tax which would be payable for the net profit of 500,000 would be 11,000. 250. Okay, these are about the basics. I will now hand over to Nero to take us through the corporate tax uh, provisions in detail. What do you, Nero? Thank you very much, Girish. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, after understanding the basics, now it is important to understand how that uh, tax will apply, which kind of pro uh, provisions will apply to a person whether an entity is a resident, non-resident, how that differentiates when a person calculates a taxable income. So the, for a purpose of UA corporate tax law, the taxable persons are bifurcated into two categories. One is a tax uh, resident and another is a non-resident. Why it is so important? Because depending upon whether an entity or a person is a resident or a non-resident, the quantum of income which will be subject to tax in the UA would be determined. So now let us understand who all are resident persons. So resident persons, as far as your corporate tax law is concerned, it means an individual conducting a business or business activity in the UAE could be in the form of so, sole establishment, civil uh, company, or an unincorporated partnership. Any entity which is incorporated, recognized or registered in the UAE. So if there is a company, LLC, such kind of entities or uh, public joint stock companies, or a free zone company or a mainland company, all kind of entities which are incorporated, recognized, or you can say considered in our, uh, as per the uh, incorporated in the, the laws of UAE, those entities will be considered as a resident entities. And also any foreign juridical person, that means a foreign entity or a company, which is incorporated outside the UAE, but effectively managed and controlled in the UAE. So for an example, if there is a foreign company, which is incorporated, say for example, in USA, or a UK, but the person who is managing or controlling that entity is sitting in UAE, then there is a possibility that foreign entity or a company may be treated as a resident. Now, why resident is so important? Because for a resident person, entire worldwide income is taxable in the UAE. So whether that, for an example, if entity earns an income in the UAE or from UK or USA, entire income, so worldwide income would be taxed in the UAE. However, as far as individuals are concerned, as we, um, uh, you can say, as we learned earlier, only business and business income would be taxable in the UAE. So whether that business is carried in from UAE or from outside the UAE, as far as that individual is resident in the UAE, that income will be taxed in the UAE. Now, after understanding resident, we will also understand who all are non-resident. So any person who is not a resident, but having a permanent establishment in the UAE, so we'll understand quickly with an example, assuming there is a foreign company, which is incorporated in the USA, UK, or somewhere other in the other country, but operating in the UA through a branch or an office or a warehouse, then that branch office or UA branch warehouse or office of that foreign company will be treated as a permanent establishment. So non-resident having a permanent establishment in the UA, non-resident deriving a UA source the income. This is a very specific concept which is there in the UA corporate tax law. You can say UA sold income, which will uh, we'll discuss this in detail in the subsequent slide. But in a nutshell, it is any income which a non-resident person earns from by way of dealing with a resident person resident in the UAE or any assets which are located in the UAE. Simple as that. If a non-resident is earning income off of that, then it is considered as a UA sold income. Third category, income, which is, uh, you can say, derived by way of an access in the UAE. Now, what is an access has not been defined so far, and we are expecting a cabinet decision. 
to specify this. However, in a general understanding, in case anybody's any person or a foreign person is earning an income by way of any connection or a business connection, there's a possibility that may be specified as a nexus in the UAE. Now, for a non-resident person only, income which is either earned or through that permanent establishment or UAE sourced income or income which is generated through that nexus in the UAE would be taxed in the UAE. So this is the big difference for a resident in their worldwide tax in the UAE. However, for a non-resident, only UAE income will be taxed in the UAE. So now, as far as now, individuals are concerned, it is very important whether they are doing business or business activity or not, because that income is subject to taxation. So the, we are expecting a cabinet decision to specify which all business activities would be subject to taxation. But based on the public consultation document, there is a possibility uh, that there was a reference in the public consultation document that any activity which requires a permit or license in the UAE, and if that activity is carried on, that possibly could be considered as a business activity. But we will have to wait for a cabinet decision to specify this thing. Also, uh, any activity which is carried on regularly for a profit motive could be considered as a business activity as a general understanding. UAE sourced income, we learned that for a non-resident, UAE sourced income could be subject to tax in the UAE. Now, what is UAE sourced income? Any income which is earned by that foreign entity or a foreign person for an individual by dealing with a, a person resident in the UAE or any UAE permanent establishment of that non-resident or activities which are performed, services rendered in the UAE, those will be considered as UAE sourced income. The example of uh, such income is sale of goods, provision of service, performance of contract, all these activities, if they are uh, in taking place in the UAE or with a UAE person, then there is a that would be income of that non-resident will be considered as a UAE source income and could be subject to tax in the UAE. Now, after understanding who all are taxable persons, we will also understand now who all are exempt persons. So for a general understanding, all the persons who are doing majorly a non-profitable or non-business activity, have been categorized as an exempt person, such as government entities, entities controlled by the government, which are doing a mandated or sovereign function and not into the business. Any person uh, doing a business of uh, extraction of natural resources or non-extracted related activities of natural resources, these activities are also, these are person are also considered as exempt person because those activities are anyway subject to tax at emirate level separately. Qualifying public benefit entities for a general understanding, we can refer it as a approved charitable trust or a institutions, because those are operating for a not for profit, but for a social causes. Those are considered as an exempt persons. Qualifying investment fund, investment fund, fulfilling certain specific criteria can be clear, can opt to be treated as an exempt or a qualifying, basically a qualifying investment fund. Public or private pension or social security funds are also considered as a exempt person, so subject to fulfillment of certain conditions. And any person who is owned or controlled, fully owned or controlled by the above uh, exempt person would also be considered as an exempt person. Only important thing to note that not all the activities undertaken by this exempt category of person would be would not be subject to tax. In case these are the entities they are doing an act, uh, activities which are considered as business activity, even, even this exempt category of person would be subject to tax in the UAE. Moving on to what are the exempt incomes? So this is very important because we all want to know which kind of income would not be subject to tax in the UAE. So first category is dividend or any profit distribution received from a resident legal person. That means if any person is receiving a dividend income, from a company which is incorporated, recognized in the UAE, then that person, that income would not be taxed in the UAE. There is no condition attached to this. Only the receipt of dividend from a resident legal person is sufficient. As far as dividend and other profit distributions received from a foreign company would also be not be taxed in the UAE, subject to fulfillment of condition of participation exemption. Now, what, uh, what is that condition is that a person is holding the shares of at least 5% in that foreign entity. The shares have been held for at least 12 months or intend to be held for 12 months. And that foreign entity is subject to tax at at least 9% in the respective country. If these conditions are satisfied, even a dividend and other profit distributions received by a person in the UAE from a foreign company 
would be subject would not be subject to tax in the UAE. Any other income, certain other income like a capital gain, foreign exchange gain, or losses or impairment gains from participation interest in either a resident legal person or a foreign legal person would not be subject to tax if they are fulfilling the participation interest participation participation exemption criteria, which we discussed earlier. Income of a foreign foreign permanent establishment can be opted to be exempt from the taxation. I again said there is an option which a person needs to apply for. Basically, we learn this with an example. Assuming there is a foreign company operating through a branch in the UAE, that branch, uh, sorry, uh, it's a vice versa case. There is a resident entity operating through a branch in the foreign country like a US or UK. Then the branch which is there in the UK and UAE, that income would be subject to tax in the U UAE, but it's a branch of a UAE entity. However, there is an option available to treat that branch income as not taxable in the UAE. If that branch is subject to tax at nine percent in the respective country, if this condition is satisfied, UAE, as far as your UAE taxable income is concerned, that foreign branch income you can claim as an exemption. Income derived by a non-resident from operating or leasing of aircraft or ship is also not taxable in the UAE. Now, if we are earning any kind of income which is exempt from tax, we have to also consider that, that whatever related expenses which we are incurring. Will we cannot claim this as a deduction while we calculate a taxable income? Free zones. We know that free zones are an important part of UAE, so that's why there is a, there are specific provisions for a free zone entities. So those are basically free zone entities are differently taxed, but there are conditions which needs to be fulfilled. Okay, assuming a free zone person needs to fulfill the criteria of being a qualifying free zone. And if it is earning a qualifying income, then that income would be subject to tax at zero percent. That effectively, that subject would not be taxed in the UAE. Now there are there are two important terminologies I have used here: qualifying free zone person and a qualifying income. Both this condition needs to be fulfilled. First part is what is a qualifying free zone? So any free zone entity fulfilling four conditions. One is that the person is you can say having an adequate substance in the UAE. Adequate substance. When I refer, that means you. We all are aware that there is a economic substance regulations in the UAE. Effectively, it says that the free zone entity is just not on the piece of paper. It is having an office, employees, and actual operations in the UAE. The free zone person having an adequate substance, deriving qualifying income. We'll understand what is qualifying income in uh, detail later on. Deriving qualifying income. It has not opted. Uh, you can say opted to be subjected to tax at nine percent. And it is complying with the transfer pricing regulations. If these four conditions are fulfilled, then a free zone person will become a qualifying free zone. And if that entity is earning a qualifying income, that qualifying income would subject to tax at zero percent. That means no tax. Other income, other than any income other than a, other than qualifying income, would be subject to tax at nine percent. And assuming this free zone entity is a part of MNC, subject to taxation at global level, are the pillar two rules which are we referred earlier. That those would be subject to tax differently later on. Presently, those would be covered by this nine percent and zero percent criteria. Important to understand that all the free zone entities will have to register and do the compliances, whether they are owning or whether they are earning only a zero percent income, that means a qualifying income or other income as well. So now we will understand what is qualifying income. As far as the law is concerned, the qualifying income has not been defined so far. We are expecting a cabinet decision through which it will be defined. But public consultation document, which was released earlier, we referred as a draft regulation, had given a hint that certain like a certain kind of income may be considered as a qualifying income, and accordingly can be subject to zero percent tax. That means really no tax. So these are the income income from transaction with business located outside the UAE. Trading with business located in the same or any other free zone, income from certain regulated financial services directed at foreign markets, passive mainland income derived royalty, interest, dividend, etc. Free zone person with designated in a designated zone with mainland good related transaction, where a mainland entity is imported on the record, and group related mainland transaction. This kind of transactions or income could be considered as qualifying income. This is subject to be specified in cabinet decision. But for a general understanding, we can take an understanding that any income which a free zone entity is deriving by dealing with outside the UAE, or with dealing with other free zones, 
could be subject to 0% tax and could be considered as a qualifying income. Now, there are other important or key areas which are relevant. Tax group, we all are aware that as far as VAT provisions are concerned, there is an option of forming, tax, forming the tax group and the compliance can be uh, done as a tax group rather than an entity level. Similar provisions are there even the UAE corporate tax law. Here, uh, if there are group of companies in the UAE, a tax group can be formed for those UAE entities and filing, annual filing and payment can be happened as a single entity. Now, what are those provisions? So for forming a tax group, uh, there, there needs to be one UAE holding company and that holding company should be holding a subsidiary company where in the subsidiary company, the holding company is having at least 95% shareholding. If these conditions are fulfilled, then those group of companies can form a tax group. What are certain kind of entities which are not subject to tax, like an exempt person or a free zone person with qualifying income, obviously they are not subject to tax and accordingly cannot be a part of a tax group. Benefit of forming a tax group is that as a tax group, a person will be filing only one return annually and not an individual entity level. Also, you can say intercompany transactions will be eliminated because this will be a consolidated income Okay, a calculation of consolidated income of group and filing as an independent or you can say single entity. So intercompany transactions are eliminated according to transfer pricing provisions and so will also not be applicable. We will understand what are those transfer pricing provisions will a little bit in later, uh, later on. And also uh, you can say a taxable income of the group as we referred, it is to be determined on a consolidated uh, basis. However, the only disadvantage of forming the tax group as one of the disadvantages is that if a person decides to file a return or do the compliance and each and every individual entity level, the threshold of 375,000 dirham up to which there is no tax will apply to that individual level entity. However, if we are forming a tax group, that will be the tax group will be considered as one entity and according to the limit of 375,000, they uh, will be available as a one only and not a separate entity level. So that's a disadvantage. So whenever we take a decision to form a tax group or, tax group or not, the overall all these factors need to be considered and then the call can be taken. Tax loss relief. This is a new uh, that's a provision in the UA corporate tax law, which allows an entity to carry forward the losses which it has incurred in one year. In the future, the carry forward can be allowed to a future period. And that loss can be set up in the future period when that person starts earning a taxable income. So assuming in year one, you are having a loss, you carry forward that loss. And in the subsequent year, maybe in the year five or six, when you are having a taxable income, all the losses which are incurred prior to that can be claimed as a set off, or you can reduce by that. When I mean set off, that means you can reduce your taxable income. And on the reduced taxable income only, the tax would be required to be paid. There are no conditions or time limits for carry forward of tax loss. Only condition is that at least we 51% Shareholding needs to be continued from the period where the loss was incurred till the time the loss is set off. And in case this shareholding changes, at least the same or similar business activities carried on. If these conditions are fulfilled, the loss can be carried forward and set off. The maximum loss which can be set off in future is 75% of taxable income of the respective future period. Only to that extent, the loss can be set off. And the loss which is remaining after setup can be carried forward for future years. Tax loss transfer. Assuming an entity is not able to form a tax or doesn't wish to form a tax group, then there is still an option available for transfer of tax loss. That means a tax loss incurred by one person can be transferred to another person who is having a taxable income. And that tax person having a taxable income can reduce its taxable income by this loss. And on the reduced income can only pay the tax, is required to pay the tax. So that's a good conditions where a person cannot form a tax group or doesn't wish to form a tax group. This provisions can be, you can say the benefit of these provisions can be of it. The condition is that at least a 75%, a person transferring a loss in another or vice versa, at least there's a 75% holding in those entities, all are the resident entities, which means the UA entities, or at least there's a third party who is holding at least 75% stake in both the entities. If these conditions are certified, the tax loss transfer can be availed. Transfer price and this is very important provisions. Provision basically it says that in case you're a group of companies, whether you're having entities in the mainland or you can say in a free zone or outside the UAE, if there are dealing with between these companies, 
then all these companies needs to comply with the transfer pricing regulations. What that means, whatever transaction are happening with group companies, whether in the UAE or outside the UAE, all those transaction needs to be at arm's length. That means it needs to be at the value at which you will deal with a third party. This is a very detailed exercise and subjective exercise based on the nature of transaction which needs to be carried on. After conducting that exercise, we need to ensure that the transaction has a third party value. If those transactions are not a third party value, the adjustment may be required to be made while calculating a taxable income and accordingly we'll have to pay on the tax on that income. So advisable wherever we are having a group related transaction, whether in the UAE or with outside the UAE entities, the transfer pricing exercise needs to be undertaken. Also, a transaction with a shareholder director also are under this ambit. An uh, important uh, thing to note is that the transfer price may be for us, the taxable period may start from Jan 2024 and the first tax period would be Jan to December 2024. But however, the transfer pricing provision needs to be factored in when I determine my opening balance of Jan 2024. So effectively, that means that before my first taxable period, it would be advisable that I do this transfer pricing assessment, I determine whether my values with the third, the, my group uh, companies are at uh, arm's length or a third party value or not. If required, it is advisable to incorporate the changes in 2023 itself. So that in 2024, in your first taxable period, we are complied with the transfer pricing regulations. NTE general, NTE abuse rule. So these provisions are already applicable now. Assuming an entity is entering into a planning exercise, considering the UAE corporate tax law is there in place, and that exercise is undertaken just to save on some taxes without any commercial rationale, then FTA can disregard those arrangements and tax as if those transactions never taken place. So if we are planning some restructuring exercise specifically to save on some taxes, it would be advisable we do not do that, or otherwise we do any restructuring only basis of commercial rationale. Other provisions like all taxable and exempt persons are required to maintain uh, all the records or books for seven years from the end of your tax period. That means effectively for eight years, we'll have to maintain all the documentation. We have experienced that people uh, somewhere, the entities are not struggling with this and they are not able to have it. Now we don't have a choice. We will have to mandatorily undergo this thing and we need to have all the records prepared as well as maintained for eight years. All the financial statements are required to be maintained as per the accepted accounting standards, whichever the entity is following, but those standards should be acceptable, accepted in the UAE. Certain category of person may be subject to audit, but this will be specified before cabinet decision subsequently. Moving on, we understood that Girish, while uh, uh, taking the basics, he referred that we need to determine the taxable income and that taxable income will have to pay the taxes. How to determine the taxable income? So we will take the base of profit as per our profit and loss statement, and we'll make an adjustment for expenses which are not allowed. We'll claim an exemption for income which are not taxable, and that we will determine the taxable income. Now let's understand what kind of expenses are allowed and not so that we can make an adjustment appropriately. Expenses which are allowed, generally all the expenses which are incurred for the purpose of business and which are not of capital nature would be allowed as a deduction. For an example, fees paid to federal or government, local or even the government authority, e-recoverable VAT, a VAT input which we cannot claim while we are determining our VAT liabilities or VAT return. Those VAT inputs could be claimed as an, in, um, you can say, deduction. I'm again clarifying VAT input which we cannot claim as a recovery. Then expenditure with dual person, assuming there's an expenditure which is having a personal and business element, for an example, car or a mobile phone, if you are claiming those expenses, the use uh, only which is related to business can be claimed as an expense. To the extent of personal, we will have to disallow those expenses. Any expenses which are incurred for a, towards meal accommodation or, or you can say supplier or customer is considered as an entertainment expenditure for a UA corporate tax law and 50% of that expense will have to be disallowed. There are certain expenses which are completely not allowed. So these are any donation gifts or grants to other than qualifying public benefit entities. That means other than an approved charitable trust or institution. If a, there are such kind of donation or grants, then we'll have to disallow those you can say donations while calculating the taxable income. Bribes, fines, penalties, or any other kind of illicit payments are not allowed as a deduction. Dividend 
paid by a UAE company dividend is actually an appropriation of profit, and accordingly, a company distributing a dividend cannot claim a deduction of that dividend. Any corporate tax which is paid in the UAE or outside the UAE cannot be claimed as a deduction. However, there is a mechanism where these taxes can be claimed as a credit while you determine your net payment liability that we'll cover later. On. We'll cover later on. Any input VAT recoverable, that means any VAT which you have paid on purchases, which you can claim as a recovery while you calculate your VAT liability. Obviously, since we are claiming there as a relief for a reduction, we can't claim it as a deduction here while calculating the taxable income. Assuming an entity uh, needs a finance and it will result to a borrowings, and there's a possibility that we'll incur an interest expense there. So, an entity is having an interest expense, there is a specific provision which will have to be considered. Any expense in excess of 30% interest expense, net interest expense, that means the interest expense might interest income. Any net interest expense in excess of 30% of EBITDA, that means earning before interest tax like depreciation and amortization, 30% of EBITDA up to that only interest, uh, interest expense would be allowed. Any excess will have to be disallowed and would be carried forward for next 10 periods for a set off in the future period. So in case we are having a borrowings and if we are incurring an expense, we need to ensure that the interest expense which we are incurring, whether we are subject to disallowance or not. Also, there's a, uh, there's a cabinet decision will uh, specify a certain threshold beyond which if we are incurring an interest expenditure, we don't have to consider this calculation of 30% of EBITDA, then we'll have to, we'll not have to make any adjustments there. Also, these provisions are not applicable to a financial institution or a bank because they are into business of, you can say, financing. In, there's a specific rule in case we, are, we have obtained a borrowing from a group companies and that borrowing has been used for the purpose of distribution of dividend because it's a so it's like an exempt income. Then such kind of, uh, you can say, borrowings, the interest which are incurring for those such kind of borrowings will not be allowed as a deduction because it's being used for the purpose of exempt income. So it will, we will, it will be advisable that each and every expense which we are incurring, we'll have to see what are the expenses which are allowable, not allowable, and accordingly we'll make the suitable adjustment. Here we have taken as an illustration how the calculation of profit as per books of account and the taxable income will be determined. So we'll start with the accounting net profit, we'll make an adjustment for expenses which are not allowed. We'll reduce by the income which are allowed as an exempt. That way we'll determine the taxable income. Is you will see the my accounting profit and the taxable income is different. In most of the cases, it would be different. So we'll have to make this adjustment on taxable income. Uh, you can say taxable income up to 375,000 dirham, no tax. Income in excess of 375,000 dirham will act like 9% tax. In this case, it's 76,500. I will claim a credit for foreign taxes paid. So taxes paid in foreign country, if I'm including that income in my taxable income, I'll claim the credit for taxes which are paid in foreign countries. So in our case, it's 10,000. And net corporate tax payable comes to 66,500, which I'll have to pay from my pocket. Quickly, we'll read the other uh, provisions. Registration, each and every taxable person, including free zone person, are required to take the registration before filing their first corporate tax return. First corporate tax return is required to be filed within nine months from the end of the uh, financial year, your tax period basically. Even existing VAT registration, uh, what, okay, in case we are having a VAT registration, do we need to take a corporate tax registration also? Yes, both are separate, so we'll have to take the registration. Also, along with the corporate tax return, which will be filed after within the nine, uh, end of the nine months from the end of the taxable period, we may also be required to file the transfer pricing documents, which will be specified later on to a certain kind of person. Tax payment, the tax liability, which we determined in the earlier slide, the net, net tax outflow will have to be also be made, uh, paid before, uh, so within the nine months from the end of the, you can say taxable period, that's the due date when we are required to file a return. In case we have paid an excess tax, the refund can be given. Tax credits we have already dealt with. In case we have our uh, taxes withheld in the UAE or in foreign country, the credit can be claimed. And also there's a possibility that the, Taxable person, certain category of taxable person may be, uh, you can say, subject to tax audits by way of tax assessments. Now, we, since we have understood the basics as well as critical aspects of the UA corporate tax law, it's very um, important to understand how do we travel this journey from understanding the corporate tax law 
to actual making an assessment and implementing that to our businesses. I will request Girish to kindly share his expert insights on this and uh, take us through that. Uh, Girish, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Thanks, Vira, for the detailed presentation on the corporate tax uh, provisions as such. You know, so I think uh, what we must have uh, seen from uh, Nirav's presentation is that uh, definitely, you know, there is a lot of work that needs to be done for us in terms of evaluating the impact of corporate tax on our business as such, right? Uh, so I'll cover with the Regarding the preparation, okay, primarily the presentation will cover the four points, okay. Uh, primarily, why bother now, okay, what are the key risks to avoid, uh, the corporate tax implementation methodology and the implementation uh, phases. So when we look today, uh, you know, why bother now, I think one of the key elements that we need to remember that we are practically in a zero tax regime from the perspective of direct taxation. I think we have had some experience of uh, VAT or indirect taxation, okay? However, now we are getting into a direct tax regime where, like I mentioned earlier, there is a direct impact on the bottom line of the organization, okay? The other element is, I think, considering the audience also, okay? We have this uh, varying degree of accounting and uh, you know, audit practices as such. And as we have seen that when we talk about corporate tax, it is referring to the net income. And as we all know that we can only know the net income when we maintain the uh, books of accounts, right? So one of the key consideration which comes in is that I think increasingly uh, the discipline of maintaining the books of accounts uh, is something that we need to get into. And obviously, I think in certain sectors like the free zone, we expect that, you know, audits kind of would become mandatory, especially if the free zone entity, as Nero referred to, if they are subject to a qualifying income, which means that they are subject to a 0% uh, taxation, right? Similarly, the structuring part of it is more important. I think these are relevant for possibly multiple uh, group entities as to whether they need to decide as whether you know, they want to kind of uh, form the tax groups or they need, they would prefer to be considered separately and, you know, enjoy the 375,000 limit as such, uh, which is currently available. Also the, uh, you know, there are certain elements of elections that are, you know, mentioned, okay, whether, you know, as a free zone, you could elect to be, you know, taxed at 9% depending upon how your structure is and depending upon whether you have any uh, foreign entities, you know, like the, if the parent company is outside and it's in a tax jurisdiction uh, where the, uh, you know, it's in high tax jurisdiction and maybe there is a requirement that might be the, for you to claim, you know, uh, that your UE entity is not taxed in the parent company jurisdictions to demonstrate possibly a minimum 9% Tax rate. So those are possibly the considerations that organizations might have, right? The other element is obviously the, uh, you know, the element where we talk about, you know, the comparative assets, right? So although we say that the effective period is 1st Jan 2024, right? Due to the provision about the comparatives largely related to the transfer pricing, right? So what it means is that the, uh, you know, 2023 would also come under, uh, you know, the review process because there has been a very simple provision stated. It says that, you know, the opening balances as of supposedly 1st Jan 2024 should reflect the transfer pricing provision, which basically means that you would need to kind of ensure that, you know, the transactions in Jan 2023 have been subject to transfer pricing as such. Okay, I think the most important element in terms of why bother now is obviously, like we mentioned, the impact on the profitability of the organization. I'm sure uh, no organization would like its uh, profit to drop by a minimum of 9%, you know, uh, starting uh, 1st June 2023, right? So that is where for us to be, be aware that, okay, there is an impact and how do we kind of uh, basically mitigate that impact, yeah? So that's something that we need to prepare for. 
Okay, obviously the key risks to avoid are uh, the usual from a perspective of risk management where we talk about that you're not giving yourself enough time to prepare. You do not understand the legislation, the tax treatments are not understood. And maybe in slightly larger organizations, if your control systems are not built in to kind of track the allowable and disallowable expenses, yeah? Because uh, if there are frequent transactions, maybe, you know, you can also build into your accounting system so that, you know, you can easily move from an accounting profit to a tax profit because you have captured the uh, relevant uh, details of allowable and disallowable in proper accounting codes. So this is something that you might want to consider. So when we talk about the implementation, generally we are, you know, we say that these are the pillars of implementation. One is around the structure where you decide that how do you want to kind of be registered from a perspective of corporate tax, okay, whether tax group, the free zone elections, right, these kind of things as such. The other element is obviously, you know, like I said about the system changes, which is maybe the medium to large organizations need to look at. And also your transaction processes so that, you know, you clearly identify the allowable and disallowable expenses and also, you know, look at the related party transactions. I think generally for small to medium, one of the key considerations is the extent of related party dealings. And when we refer to related party, as uh, Nira referred us, it, right? So it is both uh, companies as well as individuals. Yeah. So I think the common thing is about uh, the, you know, the basically the owner of the company, right? And his dealings, you know, with the company, right? So to whether in terms of his personal related expenses, whether in terms of whether he's taking managerial remuneration. So these are all considerations that we need to keep in mind. Of course, the training and communication is another element of the preparation. And I think you are attending this webinar is uh, basically significant in terms of for you now, you're actually kind of getting a awareness of how the corporate tax is going to be implemented. Similarly, when we talk about organizations, also the element is that, you know, how, do, how is the uh, communication done to all the people in the organization as such? And generally, this is what we recommend as the corporate tax implementation journey. Okay, we say that we should have started the preliminary impact assessment yesterday, obviously considering that the corporate tax law was issued on 9th of December. Okay, uh, then we move on to the detailed impact assessment and uh, subsequently is the imp implementation phase, which uh, we have put in June to December and the post December is a written filing compliance. Now, this time frame that we have broadly put in is from a perspective of somebody who is having a Jan to December financial year as such. Okay. I think uh, we have come to the end of our presentation. So, I will now hand it over to Sandhya to take us through the Q&A session. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Nirav and Girish for taking us through the session and also highlighting the significance of the why action has to be taken now. Uh, yeah, before we go to the question and answer round, as we all, as I already mentioned, we are offering one-to-one -one consultation complimentary session for the five organizations who are attending this session. Uh, Pranav from our team would be sending the link over the chat box where you can register for the same and take the benefit of this session. So moving on to the uh, Q&A, where there are questions uh, posted on the chat box. Yeah, so starting with the questions. Uh, there were some questions asked whether the presentation would be shared. Yes, it would be shared uh, over email to all the attendees. Okay, the next, uh, the question by Mr. Uh, 
Chibuzar is, hi, is this new tax regime in UAE for only companies or does it apply to individual income as well? Yeah, so I think uh, largely like uh, Nira covered, the uh, when you talk the... Uh, Basically, the legal person, as such, uh, that is referred to as the company. Even uh, individuals are liable if uh, basically they are seen to be conducting business or business activity. Of course, the definition of business and business activity is currently, you know, expected through a cabinet decision as such. So we do not have full clarity as far as that is concerned uh, from a perspective of individual. Yeah. Moving on to the next question by Mr. Sunil Chandwani. Question for financial year 2023, company financial year in Jan to December will be taxed zero for period Jan to June and 9% for the income expenses zero plus nine and tax or zero tax for the financial year 2023. Then first tax period will be filed in financial year 2024. Please clarify. Yeah. 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 So, Sunil, so basically for you, the financial first tax period is Jan to December 2024, for which only you will be paying taxes. So, as far as 2023 is concerned, not even for a single month, it will be subject to tax in the UAE. And, the and there's another question. From 1st Jan 20, Jan to December 2023. Uh, can I speak, sir? Uh, Nirav? Please, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, my question is very straightforward. Uh, see, from January to June, I earn an income X, which is tax-free, correct? And from mm -hmm. July to December, to December, I another income Y. Now, minus expenses is my net profit for the year 2023. Um, uh, my tax limit is, my taxable is zero or 9% for the six months. So, Sunil, for this entire 2023, there is no tax. Because if free and total zero. Yes, because you are following a Jan to December financial year. So for you, from Jan 24, the tax will apply. Okay. Uh, there was one more related question. Suppose in my first year, my loss is, uh, say, AED 100. And in the next year, my profit is AED 100. So 75, per, 75 I minus from 100. So 25 is left. 25 ka 9%. Yes, you're right. And uh, what happened? Suppose my uh, the income in the year two is fifty, and my loss in the previous year was hundred. Again, seventy five percent of uh, fifty. Yes, you're right. And then the balance is carried forward to the subsequent years. Yes, that's correct. Okay, okay. My last question to you: uh, If the income is being earned on an individual level, uh, um, it means I'm freelancing. Am I yeah. still taxable? So I agree, just answer that question as a earlier one. For individual, we'll have to wait what is the cabinet decision and we'll specify what kind of activities will, will be considered as a business or business activity. Assuming the activity which you are doing is covered under that business activity, then yes, you will be subject to tax. Like somebody engages me for doing a training session like on corporate tax. Could be, could be if you're having a license and all. No, no could license, be. this is freelancing. Freelancing. Oh, so we'll have to wait basically for the cabinet. Okay. Thank business. you so much, Giri, and Girish and Nirav. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I mean, next question Ali, is by Mr. Maybe we can ask Ali to ask his question. I think you see a couple of questions. So Ali, we want to ask live or do you want us to answer your question on the chat? Uh, hi, good morning. No, just keep it as uh, written. Thank you. Okay. We will answer, take his question from the. Yeah. So the question yeah, is, uh, yes, sir. this uh, question one, the said 9% tax, okay. does it include the previous 5% or it is 9 plus 5, 14%? I think he must be referring to the uh, VAT as such. Okay. And as we recognize that uh, VAT is an indirect taxation, right? So... It is not referring, VAT would not be included in this. VAT, if you look at it, very basic is that you are levying VAT on your invoices, okay, and collecting from your customer. Similarly, you pay VAT to your supplier, right? 
And yeah. so what happens is that the net is what you remit to the government. Okay, so there is no, there is nothing related to your income when you talk about VAT. Okay, however, when you talk about corporate tax, this is something on your income. Okay, to give you an example, if you're earning, a, if your sales are 100 and if your basically expenses are 50, right? The net income of 50, presumably, if that is the taxable income, you are paying the tax on that 9%, okay? Whereas if you were to take VAT on the 100, you would have you know, collected a VAT of 5%. Mm. On the 50, you would have paid a VAT of uh, 5%, right? So the net of what you go and remit to the government. Okay, so that is VAT. Whereas mm. corporate tax is something on your net income. So they are two unrelated mm. subjects. So here it is 9% to answer your question. Which sectors of the business does it cover? It practically, there is no sector that is exempt, except what Nira indicated, the uh, the exempt uh, kind of, uh, you know, basically, and largely if you look at it is either sovereign activities of your government, or it is uh, something which is related to the uh, charitable organizations or uh, possibly qualifying investment funds. So these are broadly the sector that is you know, which are out of the scope. Okay, Your I have third the, question, have, sorry, go on. Yeah, I have about real estate. I so real estate it. also, if you have a company, so real estate is something which is uh, coming within the domain of uh, corporate mm. tax. Okay, now the third question which you had about a UE contracting company which gets a construction yeah. job yeah. abroad as such, right? In that context, what we have to remember is the income which you are generating from this business is reported in the UE entity, right? So that's where it becomes liable for corporate tax in UE. Okay, you might have another risk is that since this job is being done in a third country, okay, whether you know you are considered as a permanent establishment in that country, and maybe if you are subject to tax in that country, right? But Definitely, since the company is in UAE, it would be subject to corporate tax here, right? And if you end up paying some taxation there, obviously, like we said, any foreign tax credit that you pay, that you might be eligible to take the credit to the extent of the UAE taxation, which is 9%. My last question, in case uh, there is dispute between contractors, subcontractors, about the payment or like this, for such a... Such, uh, uh, fees, I think, or such uh, uh, money should be included in the price of a contract yeah. or something to recover. So, uh, my question in case of dispute, how will be resolved between contractors, between people, between. Uh, yes. That's it. So, yeah, so, I think, Alvin, if you can mute the rest of Yeah. So I think uh, when we talk about disputes, these are primarily from a commercial perspective. And sadly, the uh, you know the taxation authority does not offer relief. The only element is, suppose if you're considered as revenue and that turns out to be a bad debt, okay, uh, where they, you're writing off that bad debt in your books, then there could be some provisions where, you know, effectively that can be deducted from your net income. Yeah, but ongoing disputes and all, these are considered as uh, primarily from a commercial perspective. Yeah, we'll move on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Girish. Uh, moving to next question by Mr. Vakil Khan. Offshore companies formed in Bermuda, BVI, or other such offshore locations are managed from here in UAE. So such companies will be taxable in UAE? Yeah. Yes, the answer is yes, because all these entities, if they are controlled and managed from the UAE, as per the UAE corporate tax provisions, this will be treated as a resident in the UAE. Yeah, let me add that there seems to be some uh, bit of, uh, you know, where people are re-looking at their BVI entities, especially when they are uh, managed and controlled from UAE. Yeah, so in, in the advent of the... Uh, corporate tax being introduced in UAE, right? So so maybe Mr. Vakil Khan, that's something that you might want to look at. 
Thank you. Moving on to next question by Mr. Hayek. Is the salary paid to the founder in a single person company considered as profit or expense? Totally. Yeah, so Hayek, it will be considered as an expense. However, we need to be sure, we need to be aware that there are transfer pricing provisions. So any payment which a single person company makes to its owner, it needs to be commensurate with third party value as if the what you have paid for third party whether that owner has actually rendered certain services for the company or not. If the third party value or the transfer pricing compliance or you can say value threshold is met, then allowed otherwise this may subject to disallowance as well. Thank you, Nirav. Moving to next question by Ms. Vapna Nair. Director salary is disallowed expenditure? Again, I think taking on from Nero's uh... You know what he said, right? Uh, I think let's take that anything that is basically related to the business is allowed. Okay. However, uh, we have the new transfer pricing provisions. So any kind of payments which are there to related parties or connected person, those will be subject to uh, the uh, transfer pricing regime. Uh, very simply put, is that all these uh, two conditions. One, is it being incurred for the purpose of business? The second element is that, is it at an arm's length? Which very simply more put in is that, is the salary that is being paid is similar to what you would pay to a third party if you were to be employed for doing that service? I think we missed one question, uh, maybe from Anushri about uh, depreciation. I think uh, earlier, I'll take that question, Sandhya. Yeah. So I think Anishwi Sridharan has asked a question about what about expense like depreciation, is it disallowed? So again, coming back to the same, anything that is related to the business is allowed. And as far as depreciation is concerned, I think uh, depreciation is an allowed expenditure. Okay, currently we haven't seen any limits in terms of depreciation that has been prescribed in the UAE corporate tax. So we would tend to believe that whatever is there as per your accounting policy, that would be allowed as such. Yeah, moving on to next question by Fadia Ahmed. Transfer pricing policy is applicable to MNC as well? Yes. Anywhere so, there is a related party or concerned person, transfer pricing is applicable. Next question by Yazan Al-Sakir. Is there any mandatory transfer pricing reporting? So I think uh, maybe Sanjay, you can answer that question yourself. Yeah. See, with regards to the transfer pricing disclosures, along with, their, uh, along with your corporate tax returns, there would be disclosure which has to be made, wherein you have to disclose all your related party transactions along with the method that is used for the uh, for deriving at the third party rate, that is the arm's length principle. And also with regards to reporting, uh, as already mentioned, there would be a compliance wherein you have to maintain a master file and a local file. The, the cabinet or the detailed transfer pricing provision, which would be coming up, will mention a threshold. You know, if you're having uh, the related party transactions more than this value, then you have to maintain these two uh, files. So I hope uh, the question is answered. Yeah. yeah. Uh, coming to the next question by uh, Shokat Ali, the salary income is applicable to corporate tax? No, I think the question is from again the uh, you know employee perspective, I presume. So you no, know, the as far as the individuals who are getting salary income, they are not subject to corporate tax. Next question by Mr. Amit. Uh, is option to file group return will be available year on year or it is one time? So with the option appears to be one time. It's not on year on year basis. The way the provisions are worded, we do not see that option to be opted uh, each and every year. So yeah, it appears to be a one time exercise. You may be allowed to add or uh, remove entity. Maybe that will have to wear, uh, check how the regulations will be covered subsequently. But yeah. It doesn't appear to be your own year option. Thank you, Nira. Next question by Yazan. Is audit audited financials a must? I think there is no 
provisions in the law which talks about audited financials. However, we have seen the public consultation document they talking about from perspective of four reasons that maybe audits uh, you know could be mandatory. But however, when we look look at the law currently, there is no provision. Yeah, so we'll have to await for further cabinet decisions if that that position is changed. Girish, next question by uh, Hiba Dalwai. If my taxable income is AD 700,000 and I have carried forward a loss of AD 600,000, I will be allowed to set off 75% from my taxable income. So that will be 525,000 AD and my taxable income is AD 125,000. Now, since it is less than 80,325,000, will I still have to pay 9% on 80,125,000? -125, also, how many years can we carry forward the loss for? Okay. So, yeah, so Hiba, basically, the, I'll answer your first question. Yes, the remaining 125,000 dirham is because the lower than the threshold should not attract a tax of 9%. Second thing, as far as carry forward is concerned, there is no time limit. So you can carry forward for indefinite period that loss which is not utilized or set off. Thank you, Nirav. Next question by Sumesh Vadwa. How many years of loss can be written off against 2024 CT payable? See, there is no write off of loss, it's a carry forward of loss. And your first taxable period will start only in 2024. Then uh, possibly you will not have any carry forward or uh, any loss carry forward from the preceding year. So 2024 is the first year from you where you will have a losses or a taxable income. In case you are incurring a loss in first year, in the second year you are having an income, you can set off that loss. And for how many years, as I covered in the earlier question? There are no time limits for carry forward. It can be carry forward uh, to indefinite period till the time it is set off. Great. Uh, thank you, Nirav and Girish for answering the questions. I would. Uh, I hope you have uh, the attendees have registered for the free one-on-one -on -one consultation. And uh, now, coming as we come to the end of the session, I would like to thank everyone for attending and for uh, taking off time. I hope it was informative and we hope to connect soon. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you all. And uh, I think the special thanks to Alvin and Pranav uh, who are, be, you know, I think the back of the screen, like, and uh, who basically helped us to organize this session. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. I think Ali has a he has put his hand, he can take it. Does he want to ask?